Many thanks go to the Aspen Square, Fred Venrick and Kathy O'Connell, Tom Bernard, Scott Lasser, Carol Bailey, Linda and Denny Vaughn, Colonel Dick Merritt, the Aspen Times, Aspen Public Radio, Aspen Skiing Company, the City of Aspen, Les Dames d'Aspen, Iceberian Rug Company, and our incredible members and our outstanding board. We are pleased to kick off our 16-year-old series with two writers known for their extraordinary prose who cross a generational divide, reminding us of the multiple narratives that exist in this world and how important they are as we work to understand the human condition. They remind us why sharing stories, writing them, and reading them is vital to our existence. This is what the Aspen Writers Foundation does. We encourage writers, we inspire readers, and we connect people through the power of stories. Kevin Powers was quoted as saying that in writing The Yellow Birds, he hoped for readers to understand that the process of coming home from a war can be as dangerous as the war itself. I had the memorable experience of meeting a man who has done just that, Adam McCabe. He works daily to make this challenging transition easier for the thousands of men and women who do it each year. He has started a nonprofit based in our valley called Purple Star, whose mission is to strengthen the homecoming safety net. On that note, it is my sincere honor to welcome Adam to the stage to share with you a bit more about tonight's authors. Good evening. I'm Adam McCabe, co-founder of Purple Star Veterans and Families. I want to tell you that it is an honor and a pleasure to be here tonight with you. As it is an honor and a pleasure to be here with both Kevin and Tobias, two gentlemen with whom I share in the bond with of having served this nation at a time of war. And at this time, if there are any veterans of the United States Armed Services, please stand and be recognized. Thank you for your service. Tobias served in combat during the Vietnam War and where his experiences led to his writing in Pharaoh's Army, Memories of the Lost War, a war in which we lost lives of over 58,000 service members. Just as tragic are the 150,000 veterans we've lost by way of suicide since the war. Both Kevin and I served in the Iraq War and interestingly, interestingly enough, we were both in country around the same time in areas of operation. Talafar, Iraq is where part of Kevin's best-selling book, The Yellow Birds, unfolds. And reading some of the work from both Kevin and Tobias, reflecting on my own experiences, and listening to the experiences of others, what I found is, no matter where we fight the war, when and where we fight the war really has little to no effect on the human response to war itself. Over the centuries, there's remained a common human response to war, although it has taken on many different names, such as what the ancient historian Herodotus described as out of heart for the reason some Greek warriors were being discharged. The same response was later described as irritable heart in the Civil War, and then shell shock and battle fatigue, and now what one in five guys are suffering from is known as post-traumatic stress disorder. Regardless of the names this human response goes by, what we know is right now every 80 minutes we, we lose an Ira Iraqi Afghanistan veteran to suicide. 540 a month, 6,570 a year. Throughout ancient and more current history, Nation's warriors have trained and prepared for war and have had little to no training and preparation to come home from war. As Kevin described in a PBS NewsHour interview in saying, the danger doesn't end when you step back on U.S. soil. It may be a danger of a different kind, but it can be just as grave and just as deadly. And it is for just that reason that Purple Star Veterans and Families has a national petition to create a homecoming preparedness and decompression training period 
the last 90 days active duty personnel are in service, where they'll get the tools and techniques that are going to be needed for them to come home and have a safe and successful transition from combat to civilian life. I want to thank the Aspen's Ryder Foundation for the opportunity to be here tonight and to discuss things that in their very nature are difficult to talk about. I want to thank all the wonderful people that worked so hard in putting this event to together and creating an environment where both Kevin and Tobias, two highly acclaimed authors and veterans, can be together and discuss and explore how through literature we can deepen our understanding of another's experience, thoughts, and beliefs, and that through the lens of another, we're prompted to look inside at our own beliefs and self-dialogue. Tobias Wolff's books include The Boy's Life, the novel Old School, the short novel The Barracks Thief, and In Pharaoh's Army, Memories of a Lost War. Tobias is also a professor of English at Stanford University. Kevin Powers is the author of the critically acclaimed novel The Yellow Birds, which was a finalist for the National Book Award. Critics have compared the book to classic war novels such as All Quiet on the Western Front and The Things They Carried. It's been said that both Kevin Powers and Tobias Wolf have something to say, something deeply moving about the frailty of a man, the brutality of war. And we should all lean close and listen. Thank you for that heartfelt introduction. Uh, well, it's always good to be back in Aspen. Uh, thank you for, to the Aspen Writers Foundation. I've had a, uh, a really wonderful friendship with that foundation for many years now, and uh, I love the work they do. Uh, so I'm, I'm always happy to, uh, to do anything with them. And, and like, but this is my first time here, and uh, I'd just like to thank everyone for uh, being so incredibly welcoming. It's a really a thrill for, to be invited here to get a chance to talk with Tobias, and uh, thanks a lot, Adam. I really appreciate that. It was a treat for me to, uh, to meet Kevin and to talk about his extraordinary novel. It really is a remarkable novel. I congratulate you on it. Um, one of the things that struck me when I was reading it, uh, just the opening line, the war tried to kill us in the spring, reminded me in some ways of the famous beginning of uh, Hemingway's A Farewell to Arms. And uh, I don't mean it in an imitative way, but the evocation of the atmosphere of that place and time that you were in. And, uh, uh, and I was curious, uh, was he uh, an influence on you as a writer, uh, not necessarily just of war fiction, but but as a writer, and I'd be curious to know who else, uh, you know, you 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 know, inspired you with this love of writing. Uh, a absolutely. I mean, I, I the Farewell to Arms in particular is one of my favorite books. I, you know, it, it's one of those books that I saw a movie recently, uh, Silver Lining Playbook. I don't know if anybody's seen that, but. Where he gets to the end of the book and, and he's, <laughs> he's so frustrated by it. <laughs> and I, I just remember identifying with that so strongly. I was, I don't know, 15 or 16 the first time I, I read that book. And, uh, you know, I felt like it was exposing me to, uh, you know, a, a level of complexity in, in, in an emotional life that I, I wasn't mature enough to appreciate yet. So I struggled with it, but you know those are the kinds of things that wa made me want to go back to books like that. Uh, we talked a little bit earlier about uh, The Great Gatsby, uh, my ninth grade English class with uh, Patty Strong, uh, reading that book and um, and not really understanding everything that was happening in it, but but realizing that there was a lot there, 
um, that it was something that I could go back to over and over again and, and continue to learn from. And, uh, you know, in particular that book, uh, the, the richness of the language. Um, there, there's an, a, a, another wolf, uh, uh, Look Homeward Angel, Thomas Wolf. That book blew me away when I was young. And then also poetry, the poetry of Dylan Thomas was something that, again, I didn't understand. I'm not sure if understanding is really what, uh, you know, the primary uh, mode of engagement with that work like that, but it excited me so much. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, when I was in my kind of teenage formative years, these these were books that, that were uh, fascinating me and exciting me just made me want to do it, you know, it made me want to try to do it. And I think in my own case, a lot of the things that influenced me were things that were like the aura around the work and the writer. And I, I for example, when I, I, all, I had the same experience of you when I first read The Great Gatsby. Um, I fell in love with it and uh, because but what I think I really fell in love with was the idea of all these great parties. And uh, <laughs> seriously, and, there, and these really cool cars. Admittedly, someone got run over by one of those cars. But <laughs> nevertheless, uh, you know, it, it, uh, it, there was a kind of glamour around that world that Fitzgerald was, of course, at some pains to puncture. But I didn't get the puncturing part until much later. Um, suddenly with Hemingway, who was for me, I, you know, a, a, a demigod in a way, I still remember where I was sitting when I heard that he, w he had died. I was just uh, 16 then, and, but already very much under his uh, spell, and, but, com you know, completely uh, ignorant of the, of the deeper, darker reaches of his work. I just loved reading about the outdoors, the way he wrote about it, and also, you know, the idea that uh, to be a writer was to spend your time fishing and hunting. <laughs> uh, I didn't know that he actually wrote, uh, and, and had to be alone for hours a day, but that for me, I think one of, the, and I still remember this vividly, one of the crowning things, and such moments are quite influential, uh, Life magazine used to have a full-page black and white uh, photograph of some uh, some good photograph at the end, often by this guy Car Shibatawa. And this was a picture of Hemingway leaving a prize fight in Madison Square Garden with Marlena Dietrich on his arm. And I remember thinking that this <laughs> was a good life, you know. Uh, uh, well, one of the things that. Uh, that I felt in, in reading The Yellow Birds uh, that I had encountered in other writers too was, was this constant sense on the part of, uh, of, of, of Private Bartle, the narrator, of the inadequacy of the story he's telling to the experience that he had. And, uh, and I'd be curious, I mean, obviously Bartle is having this trouble and and is that something that's coming out of your own struggles to tell a, a story? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it is. And I, and I think that's something that a lot of the writers that, that, that have most interested me have dealt with is this idea that the, the sort of tools that we have to approach the problems that we have as, as human beings um, are very often uh, uh, insufficient to, to kind of make any real progress. Um, like you take you know Beckett for instance, who s seems like his entire body of work is about his uh, dissatisfaction with language, his ability to to kind of accomplish anything. But in my own experience, I, ha I haven't found anything that gets as close. So when I was thinking about how I could approach these questions that I had about my own experience, the questions that people were asking me, which is what you know what was it like over there, they would say, but of course what they meant was, what was it like to be in those emotional states? Uh, what was it like to, to feel those feelings? And I suppose in a way, I mean, I focused on this idea of likeness. Can I make comparisons that will admittedly be inadequate? But how can I approach this so that 
another human being will be able to put themselves in my in 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 my shoes or these characters shoes um, so yeah absolutely I mean I for me every time I am sitting down to try to write something it's because I don't understand uh, you know it, it just seems that that's the the best, you know, the, it's the best tool that I have, um, but it's very often uh, not quite good enough. Yeah. I think one of the one of the problems that uh, I encountered in writing um, about this experience myself was that there's such a in, in literature there's such a strong, very powerful conventions grow up around uh, around war writing and. And, uh, you know, in Hemingway's wonderful story, Soldier's Home, it describes how this guy Krebs, who's come home from World War I, has so much trouble even talking about it because there's only a certain a number of ways in which people are willing to listen to him talk about it, and it's the ways they've already imagined it. And, uh, and after a while, he plays along with it and tells the stories they want to hear, and, and, and there's this devastating line that says, and in that way, he lost everything. And, you know, you see it in Tolstoy. There's a wonderful passage after a battle when young Count Rostov is describing the, the, the battle to, uh, to his family. And he realizes halfway through it that he's just kind of, that it really wasn't like that at all. That, in fact, he doesn't really remember much of what happened during that crazy, chaotic moment during a cavalry charge. And, and, and that basically he's shaping his story by all the other stories he's ever heard and the ones that are expected to be told. And even as a writer, I think, we, 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 we come up against that. I mean, Vietnam War literature, you always had to have the helicopter coming over the hill. And, you know, I mean, there was just this sort of, there was a kind of drumbeat of expectation about it. And it's hard to fight free, free of those. And I thought you did a wonderful job in your, in your novel of doing that, and partly, I think that had to do with your decision to kind of, the way you broke the narrative, I thought was really interesting, both in terms of time and tone. And I don't know if this is too abstract of a thing to talk about, but if, if, you, if you could. Yeah, no, I mean, <coughs> it, you're, you're certainly absolutely right. And I was aware of those kinds of conventions and, and that I was writing about it. <laughs> the, I mean, one of the problems is that very often these are the experiences that tens, hundreds of thousands of people share. So they become conventional because they happen that way. Um, so yeah, it's a challenge, you, you know, so, you know, I wanted to kind of, again, deal with that idea of, of him trying to put his own experience together because, you know, I, I know f for me, as you, as you said, you know, talking about uh, Tolstoy, do I really even know? Um, it very often now seems as though that was some other person that, that had those experiences, and I, I'm not sure if I even know that person very well. Um, so, so yeah, so there were times when I thought, well, I mean, I'm just going to embrace this. I'm going to embrace these conventions. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to see if there's a way to kind of put the expected in it and sort of turn it ever so slightly. Um, because I, I suppose, in a way, the, the task at hand is to is to is to get people to look at something that they see all the time um, and, and see it in a new way. I mean, particularly uh, with Iraq and Afghanistan. I mean, those images are on TV and on the internet all the time. Uh, people are exposed to them. So I tried to figure out a way to um, to tell the story in, in, in such a way that a thing that people had potentially seen thousands of times would look <coughs> different. Um, so it was, it was, yeah, it was a challenge, um, for sure. When, when you uh, began the writing of uh, The Yellow Birds, you had actually been uh, uh, studying poetry. You had uh, taken uh, workshops at uh, Virginia Commonwealth, and then you went on to that very fine program at Austin, the University of Texas, pro uh, Texas uh, program there. Uh, what was it that um, uh, that decided you to, to, to move your 
your, uh, your attempt to render this experience from poetry into fiction? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I well, I mean, one, I, I wanted the room, you know? Um, I wanted the kind of space to let, you know, for me, very often, a poem is something that happens quite instinctively. Um, it's, it's one of those things that if, if I don't get it right away, it's gone. Um, and I, I felt like, and I, I don't know if this is true, but I felt like if I tried to write something longer, if I tried to put it into a prose piece, I would give myself more room to make the mistakes that I knew I was going to need to make. Um, and I, I made <laughs> plenty of them. Um, so, so in a way, I mean, that was it. But I also wanted to, I don't know if it's just my particular approach to poetry, but um, it is kind of uh, a singular w way of, of, of looking at the world. And I wanted to try something new. I mean, I wanted to try something different. I'd been writing stories or attempts at stories since, since uh, you know, since I was a teenager when I first started writing poems. Um, and I guess I just had so much, or so many questions that baffled me that I that I knew that uh, you know I needed I needed to give myself the room to to ask as many of them as I possibly could. Yeah. Well, that's interesting that you know that you wanted a form that would allow you to make the mistakes that you knew you were going to make. It reminds me of my favorite definition of the novel which is a prose narrative of a certain length that has something wrong with it. And, uh, you know, and, and inevitably, almost inevitably, it does. I can actually think of a few novels that don't have anything wrong with them, and I think Gatsby would be one of I them. I agree with that. Absolutely. All Quiet on the Western Front, which uh, some have compared your novel to as another. Uh, and uh, I could go on, actually. Uh, so Long, See You Tomorrow by William Maxwell. But I won't go on. Uh, <laughs> But there is, I think, in, the, in, the, in, in, in poetry and in the short story, the possibility of a kind of perfection, of a kind of almost snowflake perfection that really is, is almost impossible to attain in the novel. And maybe one really shouldn't try to uh, attain it in a novel because it would, I think, uh, if you're really trying to do that, could constrict the form, it could... It could, uh, it, it, it could stifle the, the kind of rambunctious energies of the novel, you know? And uh, yours is, a, I think, an adventurous, nervy novel. I, uh, it's breaks in time and tone and place, I think, are really, really nervy. Uh, what, so you said that you had been writing stories since you were a teenager. Um, and, uh, and you uh, enlisted in the Army at 17. That's right. uh, between your junior and senior years of high school, what 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 uh, what what led to that decision for you? Uh, yeah, I mean, there were a number of reasons. I don't, you know, I don't know that I've given this answer, um, but I will tonight. I, my high school sweet sweetheart, her uh, my girlfriend in high school, her father was a recruiter. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what a piece of luck. <laughs> Uh, that is, that's God's honest truth. Um, uh, he's, he's actually a, an extraordinary man, and I'm, I'm, I'm still very close to him to this day. No, I mean, I, you, you know, I, <laughs> I my, my father had served in the Army, uh, both of my grandfathers. Um, you know, I grew up in Virginia, which is a part of the country where it's not un uncommon to, to make the decision to, to join the military, um. I, I was actually not, uh, I was particularly a bad student in high school. Uh, I was a bad student. Um, I didn't like doing my homework. Uh, so, but I did want to go to college. Um, and I was idealistic. You know, I, I, I do, for all its faults, I do love my country very much. Um, and when I was 17, I thought that it would be an honorable way to sort of achieve all those goals. Uh, to, to, to kind of give some of my time in the service of my country. And uh, yeah, it felt really, uh, you know, it felt like a really natural decision at the time. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, there were a number of, 
I guess it's, it's hard to, to think of one that uh, was more important. That maybe, maybe JJ's dad was. <laughs> well, I, I've had people, I, like you, I enlisted at, at, I was 18, but also not a high school graduate, and, and people have, in the years that passed off, some people have asked me with some sense almost of disbelief why I would have, have joined, and actually, when I, as with you, when I was growing up, it was a very natural thing in the culture that I grew up in, all the men that I uh, grew up around had served in World War II and Korea, right. sometimes in both wars. And, uh, and it felt like something that one did. Uh, and uh, uh, also better done younger than right. later. Uh, but uh, I, will, um, I will admit to another motive when I joined, and I'm curious whether you shared it. I had already, by the time I was 15 or 16, really fallen under the spell of literature. And I was a lousy student. Uh, and I, I disdained to pass a math course, and which is why I didn't have a high school diploma. And, um, but I loved reading and I loved books and I had formed the ambition by the time I was, you know, 16 or so that I wanted to be a writer. And I will admit that when I went in to the Army at 18, there was a somewhat uh, I had a motive that went beyond just getting rid of something that I knew I was probably going to have to do anyway. I, I thought it would be something that uh, a lot of the writers I admired had experienced and that would in some way feed my, the art that I hoped to practice someday. Uh, what I didn't notice perhaps enough was that all the writers that I admired were telling me not to do <laughs> the very thing I was doing. But right. in any case, yep. did you have that kind of amb ambition at that age? I mean, did... Well, I, you know, I don't know if it was um, specifically um, something that would kind of influence work that, that would come later, but I definitely wanted some kind of life experience. And I felt like the life that I was living in uh, Chesterfield County, Virginia, uh, you know, was, it, it seemed very small. Um, so absolutely the sense, uh, you know, there, there was definitely an element of wanting adventure, wanting excitement, wanting to, you know, broaden my understanding of the world, uh, to see more, to see what was out there. And, uh, and I guess in a way I thought that, uh, you know, I was a shy kid, um, not particularly, you know, confident in my, my own ability to, to sort of achieve my goals. And, and I did think that, well, they're going to, you know, they're going to toughen me up and they're going to show me how to get, how to get stuff done. So, so in a way, yeah, I mean, uh, and to be honest with you, and I, I think not maybe not in the way I would have predicted, but the kind of the freedom, uh, you know, being freed from this idea of failure, uh, this fear of failure of uh, what happens if I, if I write and nobody likes it, what happens if I, you know, whatever. Those kinds of those fears, I don't know if they're universal, but I certainly experienced them. Um, you know, after I got back and I decided that I really wanted to give it a shot, I said, well, you know, if nobody likes my writing, well, at least they're not going to shoot at me, you know, <laughs> so <laughs> I think, <laughs> anyway. So, yeah, it was a... Uh, it, it can feel like that right, sometimes. Right, it can't, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, somehow I think I, I probably share, share that, um, I, sh I think I share that with you, yeah. I mean, this idea that they're going to, you know, I'm going to figure out how to get this stuff done. One of the things that uh, somebody asked me once, and I had never really thought of it this way, but boy, it kind of opened up a, an area of contemplation for me was, uh, uh, he said, well, you know, you, you, he had read something, I don't, I, actually very little of my work is about war, but he had read something about it. He said, when you write something like that, don't you, are, are you not afraid that it will actually create a sense of glamor? about it and attract the young. And I wanted to say, well, no, it will warn them off and because that's what I hope it would do. But 
Then I looked at my own experience and I thought, well, in a strange way, it did. And uh, has, I mean, did it ever, did that gnat ever worry, you You know, kind of buzz in your ear? You know, it's funny when you, when you talked about reading, reading the writers that, that you read who were <laughs> telling you, don't do this. I mean, I, I think we probably share that in common. I, 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 I read a lot of, uh, a lot of books that that would s seem to have, have had a discouraging effect, and, and apparently they did not. Um, but uh, I don't know. You know, I, I don't know if I. Um, yeah, I certainly didn't have any idea, or I, I, I can't imagine somebody reading what I've written and thinking that it would be a good idea to go fight in a war. But again, uh, you know, as we've yeah. said, I don't know. I, I, I will probably be thinking about that uh, later on tonight. Yeah, yeah. A young person, you know, yeah. a young literary guy, maybe yeah. even a, a, a young literary woman might read this and and feel the power of the experience that produced it and 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 uh, conceive a kind of hunger for that experience. Right. I, I, in, you know, even in our own. Family, the one of my nephews. Uh, uh, there's a, a lot. Uh, one of my characters, who in in, in one of my uh, books, uh, uh, goes signs up and uh, and is on his way. And a woman says to him, "Why why are you doing this?" And he says, "Well, I I would have felt like I felt like I would have missed a base if I hadn't done this." And 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 that, but that was a character talking, and and it doesn't serve him well. But you know, I hear I have this person in my family who then starts conceiving the idea of of enlisting. Right. And he actually said to me, "Gosh, when I read that line about, I felt like I would have missed a base. That's how I felt." He said, and a sense of horror really came over me that I had been in any way responsible for somebody having that idea. And in fact, it did not serve him well. Right. Um, and uh, you know, we boy, we don't know what we do when we write these books. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's tr that's true. No, and I mean, I think, but I, but I think that idea of um, it, you know a, a desire for uh, a certain intensity of experience. Um, you know, when, when you asked earlier about what what did I sort of perceive having had enough warnings, um, you know, because even when I, when you're 17, you have to get your parents' permission. And my, my father sat down with me and said, you know, I want to make sure you know what you're doing. Let me tell you a little bit about what you might expect. He, you know, he wasn't trying to influence my decision. He respected me enough to, to, to make it with some guidance. But, uh, but I had those, those warnings. But it, there was, in, in some way, that desire to experience everything that the world had to offer. Yeah. Um, so, so, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I guess if, if somebody has that sort of desire for an experience of, of that in intensity and gravity, I suppose I would hope that uh, I wouldn't bear uh, sole responsibility for, for that decision in their life, you know what I mean? Um, yeah. And, and, and I, I think another thing that's interesting about that is, is and I, I think it ties in a little bit with something that, one of the things that, that Adam talked about, one of the things that I was interested in looking at in the book is, is the way that there's a, a, a strange twist, or, or at least there's a, in my experience, and, and probably I'm not alone in this, this coming home, um, the absence of that intense experience and how that can be a strange void um, a, a really kind of baffling void in your life, um, and that was, you know, one of the things that that, that I wanted uh, that I wanted to look at. So, in a way, I sort of understand the appeal of that, even knowing firsthand, you know, this 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 instinct to go back, um, which was thankfully, you know, I, I didn't I didn't act on it, but it was certainly something that I felt <coughs> because there's that 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 missing level of intensity.
I was, um, I have uh, nine pages of notes of things that I wanted to talk to Kevin about. I'm right at the bottom of the first page. <laughs> and, but I know that a lot of people here would like to uh, uh, ask some questions and have a conversation too. So I'm just gonna just have this last kind of observation uh, following off of this. Uh, I uh, actually I was uh, talking to some friends of mine today uh, about about because of the, you know this whole subject of war and writing had, and had come up and uh, and we were looking forward to talking about what was going to happen tonight and and I was recalling this uh, guy that used to do some construction work that I knew in Syracuse when I lived there in Syracuse New York and he had been a Marine in Vietnam and he had served four tours over there. And the last three were all volunteer, okay? I, I mean, boy, after my one, that was it. And I couldn't, uh, I mean, I, I, but I, I, I asked him, I said, why? why? Why would you keep going back? And he said, when I, he said, when I get home, I just found everything so confusing. He said, nobody understood. And I didn't know what to do when I got up in the morning. He said, when I was over there, everything was clear. My responsibilities were clear. My relationships were clear. My sense of purpose in life was absolutely clear to me. And, and I didn't have that when I came home and I couldn't live without it. And I was, I, I've never forgotten that conversation, how touched I was by that. And I think one of the th things that your novel does and that I see done by, oh, you know, a story like Big Two-Hearted River or all Quiet on the Western Front, which has an amazing description of that young soldier going home, uh, is to, I think there's a, for, for someone who's going through that to read your book, they would feel a sense of companionship, of uh, not being alone, which is, I think, part of what is so toxic to these people, these young, the uh, vets that Adam was talking about earlier. So, you know, for all the dangers of writing books like this, uh, there's also, I think, the great gift of companionship that you have offered to many people. Um, well, why don't we open it up? <coughs> <laughs> oh, I, I'm sorry, I will repeat the question. Is there any fundamental difference in writing about war from writing about life in a boys' school uh, or uh, any other aspect of one's ordinary daily life? You know, for me, I mean, I'm, even though I, I, I share a great deal of, uh, of biographical information with, with my narrator, it's not me. Um, so, uh, you know, I start with the imagination and, uh, you know, talking about the, these experiences that people are having um, that may be similar uh, in some ways to the characters in, in this book. I mean, I, I guess one of the things I do fundamentally believe is that empathy is primarily an act of imagination. I mean, so... <coughs> You know, so any, anything, you know, if I'm writing a, a, a poem that has to do with my own life growing up in Richmond or being in the war or what have you, I'm always trying to figure out a way that I can make these questions that I have relevant, uh, not just to myself, but to another person. So, so I always try to find some, some empathetic angle to go, to, be, to begin from. Well, I mean, I, that's, I think it's a real, that's a really interesting question. And, uh, and one of the things that, uh, that I notice in this uh, novel uh, that I certainly ab have observed in my own experience, whether writing about a boys' school as I have or other things, is the, uh, uh, the war, in a, in the, the war that one is really fighting uh, in this life you may occasionally be plunged into something where you have this defined enemy, defined by your state, uh, 
But the truth of the matter is that the war we're always fighting is the war with ourselves, the war within ourselves. And, uh, and that's going to be true uh, anywhere in family life, in school, in work. And, uh, and, that's, and that's the struggle that's going on here. Everything else is just a romance. If you're just fighting the world out there or some other, that's just romance. But the real tough stuff is what goes on in here. And, and, and it, you can't fight conclusive, you can't win conclusive victories in that war. It's an ongoing thing day by day. Uh, and I think that you really capture that in, in here. I mean, and, and, uh, uh, and it's, a, it's a wonderful question that you ask, I think. Um, yeah, I mean, one of the things that I, that I, uh, oh, sorry. Um, yeah, so the, the, the question is about the sort of thin line that uh, divides um, sanity and insanity, um, heroism and cowardice within, within one person at any given moment when you're dealing with these sorts of experiences. And, uh, you know, I, I, I guess one of the, I was interested in that because you know, again, it was a question that I, that I had about my own experience. I certainly was ne did never do anything uh, that was per particularly heroic or anything like that. But, but the kind of fluidity of, of looking back, of, of uh, trying to, f the struggle of trying to define my experience as, as being black or white uh, was just something that was simply impossible. There were various moments when um, I felt absolutely like I was about to just crumble. Um, there were moments where I felt competent. There were moments where I felt utterly incompetent. Uh, and those sometimes were within seconds of each other. Um, so that was something that I wanted to, to illustrate to the best of my ability in this book, the way that uh, these definitions um, become kind of irrelevant. Um, that uh, the person who may do something extraordinary uh, one minute could do something um, repugnant the next. Um, yeah, so it's a it's a it's a it's a tricky it's a tricky business, and uh, I don't know. I tried I tried to kind of rather than sort of provide a commentary on it, uh, try to just just show it as best I could. Yeah, I I have very little to add to that. I think that's a wonderful answer to that question and. The idea that we are some self that is always the same, uh, you know, we all discover soon enough that we can be different people at different times, and and uh, and and even within even in the same day. So uh, yeah, I and we hold ourselves sometimes to standards that are uh, are going to make us feel inadequate later on because. Uh, we are bound to disappoint ourselves uh, in, 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 in life at different times, and uh, we don't allow enough for that, I think, in our, in our ways of thinking about, about ourselves. Simple question, Kevin. Why are you living in Italy? Oh, uh, a simple answer. My my wife is uh, is doing a master's program in fashion design, and she let me come with her. So. <laughs> and a simple question back to you: Why not? <laughs> no, no, no. I I mean I. Uh, I had, I had the opportunity to study abroad when I was doing my undergraduate. I, I went to Sicily and fell in love with the culture. So when she told me that she wanted to do her master's there, over there, I said, uh, I think that sounds like a great idea. Let's go, yeah. 
No. Um, no, so it wasn't any kind of statement or anything. I'm not sure <coughs> if you have answered this question um, a couple of questions ago, but I'm wondering if the if the readings didn't deter you from signing up and your parental talks didn't sign you, didn't uh, deter you from signing up. For either of you, was there ever a defining moment that you can remember when you went, this was a bad idea? And then if there was, what did you do to cope with the fact that you had to stay there? Well, um, yeah, there was a defining moment for me. I remember it quite vividly. I was, uh, when, I was when I shipped out to Vietnam, we flew from uh, Oakland to, uh, from the replacement depot, the repo depot as they called it in Oakland, to Hawaii and then on to Vietnam. And after we left Hawaii, one of the engines went out on the airplane, and uh, this is true, and you know, I took it as an omen. And the other thing that was happening was I, s it was like about an 18-hour flight, I think that was about that long, and the guy I was sitting next to had been a helicopter pilot uh, in Vietnam. He, had all he was going back for another tour, and he was terrified. He was terrified. And uh, and it was catching. It, <laughs> it was the first time I, I mean, you know, the people I had trained with and served with had always put a good face on things. And, and this was a man who was going, I mean, they were really in danger, the helicopter pilots at, at that time. Uh, really, really, really a tough, tough uh, gig. And, uh, and, and feeling that fear come off that man, and, and I just, by the time I reached uh, Thompson at Airport in Saigon, I, I knew I was getting into something that I had no idea of. Um, yeah, for me, it, it, you know, similar experience. I, we spent two weeks in Kuwait, I suppose, acclimatizing or, or whatnot, and, uh, and then we took a I can't remember if it was a C-141 or C-130, whatever it was. But uh, somewhere over Iraq, uh, before we landed in uh, Mosul, the, this fairly large aircraft, which, which didn't seem to be all that maneuverable, started doing really quite, uh, making a lot of sudden movements. Uh, and they were doing evasive maneuvers before they landed. And uh, it just... For, for some reason, the, the kind of the difference between knowing something intellectually and, and feeling something very viscerally uh, clicked, and I realized they're doing this because they're afraid somebody's going to shoot us down. And uh, I was very happy to land, um, <laughs> but I really wanted to get on the plane and go back. Uh, and I, I knew that I, I mean, I knew that I couldn't. And I think you stay because. Uh, you know, I, I mean, for me, it's it's very simple. And again, I get the, one of these these ideas that are that seem to be sort of constant uh, and that you have to contend with that you're writing is I, I cared very deeply about the people that I was there with, and the idea of uh, abandoning them, uh, even though it wasn't a, a practical uh, option, um, was it just seemed so much worse than than uh, any of the other alternatives. I couldn't I couldn't possibly imagine leaving my friends. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my name is Paul Anderson, uh, and I'm not a veteran, uh, but your book has given me insights into what that experience might be. Um, and it's got huge value for me in that. Um, my reaction is ultimately sympathy. And my action is to form an organization, which I have done. Um, most of the vets in this front row are on my board. Um, the idea is to use the 10th Mountain of Huts system here that surrounds Aspen uh, to heal veterans or to offer a venue for healing where wilderness could become a place, place of national healing. And I'm just wondering uh, if either of you uh, or both of you uh, have 
PTSD symptoms and how you cope with those? Probably have to ask my wife. <laughs> I'm not aware of, of having them. I probably had them. I'm, I think I probably would have fit the, the, some of the diagnoses when I first got back, but I've been very lucky. Yeah, no, I mean, I had, uh, I, I definitely, the first couple of years I, I was back, I had a lot of um, um, very strong reactions to certain noises, smells, things like that. Um, still occasionally, I don't know why, but the smell of a, a diesel engine, um, you know, it's not something that, that, that uh, it's debilitating these days, but uh, it always just makes me think of um, sometimes unpleasant experiences. So, uh, you know, I, 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 I again, I'm, as Tobias said, I'm very fortunate in that what, what I've had to deal with is uh, insignificant compared with what some of the guys were, and women are dealing with now. Um, I've managed to kind of cope with that stuff by, uh, you know, by exploring it, um, by talking to the people that care about me, um, you know, those kinds of things, by, by getting out into the, into the wilderness, by doing the things that, that uh, make me feel like I'm a, you know, like a person of value in the world. Um, so, so, yeah, I mean, um, but, uh, but, you know, it, it, can be, it can be real tough. And, it, you know, I know a lot, of, a lot of the people that are struggling with it are, are having it much tougher, tougher than I did. So, um, but I think that's a, a really valuable, uh, you know, option to have to, to, to get people out. Sometimes just getting out of your own head is, uh, it can be dangerous up there. I, one of the things that I thought that I had when I got back was that I just paced all the time. I'd get up and pace. And, and so I was starting college, and I, was, I really found it hard to study, to just sit at a desk. So, uh, and, and I was just so jumpy, walking around all the time and everything. And I thought maybe, I don't know, I thought it was connected maybe, maybe to my service. I had just <coughs> come back a few months earlier. So I, I was in England where it's free to go to doctor, so I went to a doctor. And... Uh, so I was sitting in his office, he's looking at me, I'm describing it. He said, how many cups of coffee do you drink a day? <laughs> and I said, about 30. <laughs> and he healed me. <laughs> One more question. Thanks. Uh, I'm Janice Nark. Um, in writing about war, do you find it, what is the process that you go through, and is it easier to write fiction or nonfiction? And have you, have you written truly, you talked briefly earlier about short stories, how the vignettes are easier, they're, they're more of a snapshot than a novel, and they're easy to write, and I know, I know that because I've done that. But what, what is the difference in the process between fiction and nonfiction? And is one uh, less traumatic than the other? Well, I don't think, I don't find it easier to write short fiction. I just think that it, I just suggested that it might be more within the realm of possibility to, per, to write something perfect. But uh, I, no, I, find, I find it pretty hard to write short fiction and to write memoirs and to write novels, so none of them are really any easier for me. But um, uh, um, the, the question about writing, whether to write fiction or nonfiction, is really a good one. I, I, uh, it, sometimes, like, I, I wrote... I thought I wasn't going to write any fiction about Vietnam. I, I really didn't somehow particularly want to, and there had been some really good books written, and I didn't start writing about Vietnam until like 25 years or so after. And, uh, but, uh, you know, I wrote a short story that I liked and I published later on that was set over there, but I knew, all. I was suddenly aware in writing this fiction of all the stuff that I had left out. And, and that it was peculiar. I had a story that hadn't been told before. I, had a, I was with a Vietnamese unit. I didn't serve with a, an American unit. And 
I just had different, uh, you know, experiences in most of the things that I'd read and seen. So at a certain point, I thought this might be, you know, a valuable kind of witness to bring to that experience and, and also to look at it again myself because I'd been kind of ignoring it. But it really wasn't a, um, none, none of them are easy and it's all, you know, writers have seasons. You know, they have seasons and sometimes you know, you're in the season of a novel and sometimes you're not. And, and uh, so I'm glad to have other things to write when I'm not. But I I in the vignettes, in the vignettes, the nonfiction, telling your stories, were, were you able to do that? Um, in the vignettes, uh, I'm not sure what you mean. Well, to, just to be able to, to tell your story with no fiction, this is, yeah, yeah, and 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 <coughs> that. How did that compare to writing? Fi I've never written fiction. I um, only I tell my stories because you can't make that shit up. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's like there was it, and and like. Well, apparently, like, a lot of memoirs can make that <laughs> shit up. <laughs> 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 um, you I, obviously hold yourself to a good standard. I I do. I do, and, and like you, I didn't, I didn't r write about Vietnam or think about Vietnam for 25 years. It was after Desert Storm that the memories started coming back, and I started writing them, and I just went, wow. Yeah. But it never occurred to me to write fiction, so I, I just wondered if the process was different. And how you, and how you did it. No, nah, mostly the process is showing up, and <laughs> as Evan Cannell said, you know, about you know, the days that he spent writing, somebody asked him, isn't it great being a writer? He said, I don't know, he said, I spend six hours a day taking commas in and putting them, uh, <laughs> taking them out again. And, you know, so that's what the process is. Well, thank, you. thank you all for joining us.